From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hello, welcome to the special Cube Conversation. I'm John Furrier here in Palo Alto, California. In our remote studio, we have a quarantine crew here during this COVID-19 crisis. Here talking about the, the crisis and the impact to business and overall work. Um, joined by a great guest, Dustin Kirkland, CUBE alumni, who's now the chief product officer at Apex Clearing. And this COVID-19 has really demonstrated uh, to the mainstream world stage, not just inside the industry that we've been covering for many, many years, that the idea of at scale means something completely different and certainly DevOps and Agile is going mainstream to survive and people are realizing that now. And no better guest than have Dustin join us who's had experiences in open source. He's worked across the industry from Ubuntu, OpenStack, Kubernetes, Google, um, Canonical. But Dustin, welcome back to theCUBE here remotely. You're looking good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks John. Uh, last time we talked, I was in the studio and here we are uh, talking over over the internet. This is a lot of fun. Well, I really appreciate it. I know you've been in your new role since September, lots changed. But one of the things why I wanted to talk with you is because you and I have talked many times around DevOps. This has been the industry conversation. We've been inside the ropes. Now you're starting hmm. to see with this new scale of work at home, forcing all kinds of new pressure points, giving people the, the realization that the entire life with digital and with technology can be different. It doesn't have to be you know, kind of augmented with their existing life. It's a full on technology driven impact. And I think a lot of people are, are learning that and certainly healthcare and finance are two areas in particular that are impacted heavily. Obviously people are worried about the economy and we're worried about people's lives. These are two major areas, but even outside that, there's new entrepreneurs right now that I know who are working on new ventures. You're seeing people working on new solutions. This is kind of bringing the DevOps concept to areas that quite frankly, weren't there. I want to get your thoughts and reaction to that. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, the whole world has changed in 30 short days. You know, we we knew something was amiss uh, in China. We knew that there was a lot of just danger for, for people. Uh, the danger for business though, didn't become apparent until vast swaths of the workforce got sent home. Uh, and there's a number of businesses and industries that are uh, coping relatively well with this. Um, certainly those who have previously adopted or have experience doing work remotely, uh, doing business by video teleconference, uh, having um, resources in the cloud, uh, having just people and expertise who are able to continue working at nearly 100% capacity in 100% remote environments. Uh, there's a lot of technology behind that and there are some industries uh, and in particular some firms some organizations uh, that were really adept and were able to make that shift uh, almost overnight you know maybe there were a couple of bumps along the way some vpn settings needed to be tweaked some zoom settings needed to be changed a little bit uh, but but for many this was a relatively smooth transition uh, and we may be doing this for a very long time yeah, I want to get your thoughts as an industry before we get into some of this, the product stuff that you guys are working on, some other things. What's your general reaction to people in your circles, um, uh, inside the tech industry and, and tech industry and outside? What are you seeing a reaction to this new scale, work from home, uh, social distancing, isolation? What, have, what, you, what are your observations? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think we're in for a long haul. This is going to be the new normal for quite some time. Um, I think it's super important to check on the people you care about. You know, before we get into uh, pen and tech, uh, check on the people you care about, uh, especially people who uh, either aren't yet respecting the social distancing norms. It, it impress upon them the importance that hey, this is uh, this is about you. This is about the people you care about. It's about people you don't even know, um, because there are plenty of people who can who can carry this and not even know. So definitely check on the people that you care about. Uh, and reach out to those people and stay in touch. Uh, we all need one another more, more, more than ever, uh, right? Um, I manage a team, and it's super important, I think, to understand how much stress everyone is is under. Um, I've got over a dozen people that report to me. Most of them have kids and families. Uh, we start out our weekly staff meeting now, and we bring the kids in. You know, it's just that they're curious. They want to know what's going on. So. Yeah. 
first five, 10 minutes of our meeting is meet the family. Uh, and that demystifies some of what we're doing. It actually keeps the other 50 minutes of the meeting uh, pretty, pretty quiet in our experience. Uh, but it's really humanized an aspect of work from home that's always been a bit taboo. You know, we, we, we laugh about yeah. the, the reporter in Korea whose kid and his, his wife came in, you know, during the middle of a live on air interview. Uh, there, there's certainly, I've worked from home for almost 12 years. I like those are really uncomfortable situations until about a month ago when that just became yeah. the norm. Uh, and from that perspective, I think there's a, a humanization that, uh, that we're far more understanding of people who work from home now than ever before. It's funny, I've heard people say, you know, my wife didn't know what I did until I started working at home. Um, <laughs> and to comments to seeing people's family and saying, well, that's awesome. And just bring a personal connection, not just this software mechanism that connects people for some meeting. And we've all been on those meetings. They go long right. and you're sitting there and you're, you're turning the camera off so you can sneeze, all these things are happening. But when you start to think about the, beyond it being a software mechanism, yep. that it's a social, equation right now. People are have shared experiences. It's been an interesting time. Yeah, and just sharing those experiences, you know, we we do a thing internal on our Slack channel every day. We try to post a picture. We call it hashtag recess. And at, at recess we take a picture of walking the dogs or playing with the kids or gardening or, you know, wh whatever it is, going for a run. Uh again, just trying to make the best of this, take advantage of, you know, it's hard working from home, but trying to take advantage of some of those uh, once in a lifetime opportunities we we have here. Uh, and we started, uh, my team has started pub quiz on Fridays. So we're, we're mostly spread across uh, in the US. And so it's able, we're able to do this at a reasonable hour, but the last couple of Fridays, uh, we've jumped on a Zoom, uh, downloaded a, a pub trivia game. Most of us cracked a, a beer, a glass of wine or a cocktail. And, you know, it's just, it actually puts a punctuation mark on the end of the week, puts a period on the end of the week, because yeah. that's the other thing about this, man. If you don't have, uh, some boundaries, it's easy to go from an eight or nine hour normal day to 10, 12, 14, 16 hour days. Saturday bleeds into Sunday, bleeds into Monday. Uh, and then, you know, just the, the rat race takes over. You got to get the exercise, you have a routine. That's my experience. Yep. Um, what's your advice for people who are working at home for the first time? Do you have any best practices? Um, yeah, so I, I actually had a blog post on this about two weeks ago and put up almost a, a shopping list. Some of the things that I've, I've assembled here in the, in the work from home environment. Um, it's something I've been doing since 2008. Uh, so it's, it's been there for, for a good long while. Uh, it's a little bit hard to accumulate all the technology you need. Um, but I would say most important um, have a space, some, some kind of space. Uh, you know, some people have more room or, or less, uh, but even just a corner in a master bedroom with a stand-up desk, uh, some space that is is your own, uh, that the family understands and respects. Um, the other best practice is, you know, set set some time boundaries. I like to start my day early. Um, I'll, I'll try to break for a little bit for that recess, see the family some, uh, and then, you know, knock off at, at a reasonable hour. So establish those boundaries. Um, yeah, I've, I've got a I've got a bunch of tips in in that blog post. I didn't shoot you after this, but uh, it's it's the sort of thing that you know be a bit understanding too of other people in this situation for the first time, perhaps. Um, so you know, offer offer whatever help and assistance you can, and be understanding that man, things just aren't like they used to be. That's great advice. Thanks for the insights. Want to get to something that I see um, happening, and this always kind of happens when you see these waves where there's a downturn or there's some sort of uh, an event, in this case it's catastrophic and the way it vectored in like this and the impact as we just discussed. But what comes out of it is creativity around entrepreneurial activity uh, and certainly uh, reinvention, businesses, reforming, retrenching, resetting, whatever word, pivot, um, digital transformation, there's plenty of words for it. But this is the time where people can actually get a lot done. I was always commenting in my last interview I did, uh, you know, Shakespeare wrote Macbeth when he was uh, sheltering in place and Isaac Newton invented calculus. So, so you can actually get some work done and, and you're starting to see people look at the new technology and start disrupting old incumbent markets because now more than ever things are exposed, the opportunity recognition becomes clear. So I want to get yep. your thoughts on this. You're a product person, you got a lot of product management skills and you're currently taking this DevOps to financial market with FinTech and your business. So you're applying known principles in software and tech 
and disrupting an existing industry. I think this is going to be a common trend for the next five years. Yeah, so on that first note, I think you're exactly right. There will be a, a reckoning uh, and there will be a ton of opportunities that come out of this um, for the for the already or the rapidly transformed digital native, digital focused business. Uh, there, there will be some that survive and thrive here. I think you're seeing a lot of a lot of this with, uh, you know, with with the popularity of Zoom that has spiked recently. I think you're going to see technologies like DocuSign being used in places that some of those places that still require wet signatures, but you just you can't get to the notary uh, and and sign a um, I don't know a refi on your mortgage or something like that. Uh, and so I, I think you're going to see a bunch of those. The the biggest opportunities are really around our education system. You know, I've got two kids at home. Uh, and I'm in a pretty forward thinking school district in, in Austin, Texas, you know, um, but that's that's not the norm, uh, you know, where where our teachers are uh, conducting classes and assignments over Zoom. I've got a kindergarten and a second grader, right? There's somewhat limits to what they can do with technology. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot of entrepreneurial solutions that develop uh, in that space. And that's going to go from uh, K through through 12 and then into college. Uh, You think about how uh, universities have have had to shift and cancel uh, classes, and what's happening with graduation. Um, you know, I've got a six and an eight year old, and I've been told I need to save two hundred thousand dollars a piece for each of them to go to college, uh, which is just an astounding number, um, especially to someone like me who went to an inexpensive public university on on a scholarship. Uh, saving that kind of money for college. Uh, and just thinking about how much more efficient our education system might be with a lot more uh, digital, um, uh, a lot more digital education, digital uh, testing, and 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 classes, uh, while still maintaining the college experience. You know what what that's going to look like in ten years. I think we're going to see a lot of changes over these next eighteen months to our that, education. Dustin, talk about the um, event dynamic. Physical events don't exist currently. Certainly, even when they come, do come back, they should and they will. The role of the virtual space is going to be highlighted and new opportunities will emerge. You mentioned education. People learn, not just for school, whether they're kids, whether they're professionals. Learning and collaboration and work tools are going to reshape. What's your take on, on that marketplace? Because you know we got to do virtual events. You can't just replicate a physical event yep. and move it to digital. It's a complex system. Boy, yeah, you're. I mean, you're talking about an entire industry. You know, we saw the the Google events, Google Next, Google I/O, the Microsoft events, uh, just across the. Uh, I'm here in Austin, Texas. All of South by Southwest was was canceled, which is just, it's breathtaking. Um, you know, when does that when does that come back, and what does it look like? Is it a year or two, uh, or more from now? What do um, uh, it, you know? Events is what what where I spend my time, and when I get on a plane and I fly somewhere. Uh, I'm usually going to a conference or a trade show. Uh, think about the, the the sports industry. You know, people who get on a plane to go to an NFL game. Um, John, I, I don't have all the answers, man, but I'm telling you, that entire industry is rapidly, rapidly going to evolve. You know, I, I hope and pray that one day we're back to a. I can go back to a college football game again. Uh, I hope I can uh, sit in a sit in a cube studio at a at a KubeCon or an OpenStack or some other conference again. Hey, we should um, do a rerun because I was watching yeah. the Patriots game last night, Tom Brady beating the Chiefs, October from last year. It was one of the best games of the season. Uh, went down <laughs> to the wire and I watched it. I'm like, okay, that's Tom Brady still in the Patriot uniform on the TV. But yep. I mean, it, do we do reruns? I mean, this is the question right now. There's a big void for the next three months. What do we do? Do we replay the highlights from the Cube? Do we have physical get-togethers with Zoom? What's, what's your take on how people should? Yeah, think about you know, the, the reruns only go so far, right? I, I, uh, I'm a, I'm a Texas Aggie, man. I could, I could watch Johnny, Johnny football in his prime any time, <laughs> uh, but I know what happened. And those games, they're just not as exciting as, as something that's a, that's a surprise. Uh, I'm actually curious about esports for the first time. You know, what, what would it look like to watch a couple of kids who are really good at Madden uh, football on a PlayStation go at it? Um, what would what would other games that I've never never seen uh, look like? 
uh, in our space, it's a lot more about, I think, uh, podcasts and live content and staying connected and apprised of what's going on, making, making new Uh, we locked up there for a second. Uh, make, no yeah, I, it's it, it's. Uh, I think it's going to be really interesting. I, um, I'm still following you guys. I certainly see you on on uh, active on social media. Um, I'm I'm sort of more addicted than ever to, to to live news, and in fact, I'm ready to start seeing some stuff that doesn't involve, uh, you know, COVID nineteen. So, okay. uh, from that perspective, man, keep keep churning out good content and good content that is uh that that's pertinent to to the rest of uh the rest of our industry that's great stuff well dustin take a minute to explain what you're doing at apex clearing yeah um your mission and what are you guys excited about yeah um so apex clearing we are a, we're a fintech we're a very forward focused digitally focused fintech uh we are well positioned to continue servicing the needs of our clients in this environment we went uh, fully, fully remote. Uh, the first week of March, long before it was was mandatory, uh, and our business shifted uh, pretty seamlessly. We worked through a couple of hiccups, uh, provisioning extra VPN IP addresses, and upgrading uh, a couple of service plans on some of the software as a service we buy. But besides that, our our team has done just a, uh, a marvelous job transitioning to remote. Uh, we are in the broker dealer and uh, registered advisor space. So we provide the clearing services, which handles stock trades, equity trades in the back end, and the custodial services. We actually hold uh, safeguard the equities that our our correspondents, we call our, our clients correspondents, their retail customers end up holding. Um, so we've been around in our current form since about 2012. Uh, this was a, a retread of a previous company that was, was bought uh, and retooled as Apex Clearing in 2012. Uh, very shortly after that, we helped uh, Robinhood, Wealthfront, Betterment, a whole bunch of really forward-looking companies uh, reinvent what it meant to buy and sell and trade securities online uh, and to hold assets in a, in a robo uh, advisor uh, like, like Betterment. Uh, today, we are um, we're definitely uh, well-known, well-respected for how quickly and seamlessly our APIs can be used by our correspondents in building uh, really modern e-banking and e-brokerage uh, experiences. So you got um, the platform, so that, that, are you guys up like a DevOps platform or you got APIs? We're, we're more like a software as a service okay. or FinTech and brokerage. So our products uh, are largely APIs that our correspondents use their own credentials to interact with. Uh, and then using our APIs, they can uh, open accounts, which means uh, get an account number from uh, from um, the, the systems that allows them to then fund that account, connect via uh, ACH and other bank uh, connectivity platforms, transfer cash into those accounts, uh, and then start conducting trades. And some of our correspondents have that down to a 60 second experience in a mobile app. From a mobile app, you can uh, you can register for that account if you need to take a picture of uh, of an ID, uh, have all of that imported, add your tax information, have that account number um, associated with your banking account, move a couple hundred dollars into that banking account, and then if the if the stock market's open, start buying and selling stock uh, in that in that same in same window. Great. Well, I wanted to um, talk about this because to the earlier bigger picture, I think people are going to be applying DevOps principles, uh, younger entrepreneurs, and also, you know, reborn, if you will, professionals who are <laughs> old school, <laughs> IT or whatever, bring in moving faster. Um, right. And you wrote a blog post I want to get your thoughts on. You wrote yeah. it on April 2nd, how we've adapted Ubuntu's time-based release cycles to FinTech and software as a service. Yeah. What is that all about? What do you, what's, what's the meaning behind this post? You guys are doing something yeah, new, so unique, or? Yeah, to, to this industry and to many of the people around me, even our, our, our clients and customers around me, this is a whole new world. They've never seen uh, anything like like it. Um, to those of us who have been around Linux, open source, certainly Ubuntu, OpenStack, Kubernetes, it's just, it's standard operating procedures. There's nothing surprising about it necessarily. Um, 
but either it's some combination of the financial services world, just the nature of proprietary software, uh, but also the concept of software as a service, SaaS, which is very different than Ubuntu or Kubernetes or OpenStack, which is released software, right? We ship software at the end of an Ubuntu cycle or, or a Kubernetes cycle. It's very different when you're a software as a service platform and it's a matter of rolling out to production uh, some changes and those changes then, then going live. Um, so I, I wrote a post mainly to give some transparency largely to our clients, our correspondents. We've got a couple of hundred uh, customers that use the Apex platform. I've met with many of them in a, in a sort of one, one on many, one to one, one on many basis where I'll show up and deliver the product roadmap. A couple of product managers will come and do a deep dive. Part of what we communicate to those customers is around now, around our release cycles. And to many of them, it's a foreign concept that they've, they've just never seen or heard before. Uh, and so I put together the blog post. We shared it internally and educated the teams, and it was well received. Uh, we shared it externally, privately with a number of of customers, and it was well received. And a couple of them, actually, a couple of the Silicon Valley based customers said, "Hey, why don't why don't you just put that put this out there on on Medium or on your blog or uh, under an Apex banner? Um, because this 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 actually would be really well received by others in the family, other other partners in the in the family." So I'm happy to, to kind of dive into a couple of the key principles uh, here, and we can sort of talk through it if you're interested, John. Well, I think the main point is you guys have a release cycle that is the speed of open source to SaaS and FinTech, which again, proprietary stuff is slower, monolithic. <laughs> yeah, no, no the, the, the key principle is that, you know, we've taken this and we've made it predictable uh, and transparent, and we commit to these these cycles. and so. Uh, you know, most people may be familiar with Ubuntu releasing twice a year, right? April and October, Ubuntu has released every April and October since 2004. I was involved with Ubuntu between 2008 and uh, 2018 as an engineer and engineering manager, and then a product manager and eventually a VP of product at Canonical. Uh, and that was, that was very much my life for, for 10 years oriented around that. Um, in that time, I spent a lot of time around OpenStack uh, which adopted a very similar model. Uh, OpenStack's released every six months just after the Ubuntu release. Uh, a number of the, the members of the technical team and the committee that, that formed OpenStack came out of either Ubuntu or Canonical or both and uh, really helped influence that, that community. Um, it's actually quite similar in Kubernetes, which developed independent generally of Ubuntu. Kubernetes releases on a quarterly basis about every three months. Uh, and again, it's the sort of thing where it's just a cycle. It happens uh, like clockwork uh, every every three months. Um, so when I when I when I joined Apex and took a look at a number of the the needs that we have, our correspondents have, our relationship managers, our sales team, you know, the client facing people in the organization, uh, one of the biggest uh, items that bubbled straight to the top is our customers wanted more transparency into our roadmaps, tighter commitments on when we're going to deliver things and the ability to influence those. And you know what? That's not dissimilar from any product manager's plight anywhere in, in the industry. Um, but what I was able to do was take some of those principles that are common around Ubuntu and Kubernetes and OpenStack, which by the way, are quite familiar. That We use a lot of Ubuntu and Kubernetes inside of uh, Apex. And many of our correspondents are quite familiar with those cycles, uh, but they'd never really seen or heard of a software as a service, a SaaS vendor using something like this. So, so that's what's that's what's new. You um, got some cycles we, uh, going on. You got schedules. So, just looking here, just to get get this out there, because I think it's yeah, it's data. You got um, you did it last year in October, November mid cycle in January of this year. You got a couple summits coming up. Yeah, that's right. So date? we've. So we've broken it down into three cycles per year, three 16-week cycles per year. Um, so it's a little bit more frequent than the, the twice a year Ubuntu, not quite as frenetic as the uh, quarterly Kubernetes cycles. Um, 16 weeks times three is 48. Uh, that leaves us four weeks of slack, really to handle uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas and end of year uh, holidays, Chinese New Year, whatever might, might come up. Uh, I'll tell you from experience, it's always been a struggle in the in the Ubuntu and OpenStack and Kubernetes world, it's it's hard to plan around uh, those cycles. So what we've done here is we've actually just allocated uh, four weeks of of a slush fund 
uh, to take care of that. So we're we're at three 16-week cycles per, per year. Um, we version them according to the year and then an iterator. So 20A, 20B, 20C are our three cycles in 2020, and we'll do 21 A, B, and C next year. Uh, each of those cycles has three summits. So to your point uh, about, you know, we, we'd get together uh, back in the, but before, before everyone stopped traveling, uh, we very much enjoyed uh, twice a year getting together for KubeCon. Uh, we very much enjoyed the, the OpenStack summits and the, uh, the, the various Ubuntu summits. Um, inside of a small company like ours, uh, these were physical. We'd get together in Dallas or New York or Chicago or Portland, which is the four places we have uh, offices. We were doing that basically every six weeks or so for one of these summits. Now they're all virtual. We handle them over over Zoom. Uh, when they were physical, we do the summit in about three days of packed agendas, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Now that we've gone uh, to virtual, we've actually spread it a little bit thinner across the week. And so we've we've done um, we've poked some holes in the day, uh, which has been an interesting learning experience. And I think I think we're all much happier with the most recent summit we did, spreading it over the course of a week, uh, accounting for time zones, giving ourselves you know everyone uh, you know lunch breaks and stuff. Well, we'll have to keep it checking in. I want to certainly collaborate with you on the virtual digital. Check your progress. Um, we're all learning and iterating, if you will, on the value that you can do with these digital ones, try to get that 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 success with physical, not always easy. Appreciate, right. you're looking good, looking good and safe. Stay safe and great to check in with you and congratulations on the new opportunity. Yeah, thanks John. Appreciate it. Dustin Kirkland, Chief Product Officer at Apex Clear. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE, checking in with a remote interview during this time where we are getting all the information of best practices on how to deal with this new at scale, the new shift that is digital, that is impacting and opportunities are there, certainly a lot of challenges and hopefully the healthcare, the finance and the business models of these companies can continue and get back to work soon. But certainly the people are still sheltered in place, working hard, being creative. Bringing the coverage here in theCUBE, I'm John Furrier. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.